The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. This is one of the most powerfully packed lectionary series you will find in the entire year. From Jeremiah to Romans to this text in the Gospel of John, it is, it is over a year's worth of teaching. And, and I'm saying that conservatively. I could stick to those three passages, teach a congregation, grow a congregation, expand a congregation, have much greater impact from a group of people than mostly any other combined text in the lectionary. And still, interestingly, you find this passage, John 8. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And the odd part is, this text today, our New Revised Standard Version, gets it incorrect. The Greek word continue is not continue. It is not continue. Please cross it out of your bulletins. It's wrong. It's flat out wrong. The Greek word is abide or meno, and meno is not continue. It's abide. Continue is like saying, I'm going to have lunch. Yet, in fact, I'm going to have a turkey sandwich with lettuce, tomato, and a little bit of mayonnaise and mustard. I'm correct in saying I'm going to have lunch but I'm not. To be specific, I'm having a turkey sandwich the way I like it, and that's what gets us off the wrong path right there because in our English translation, we blew it. We get it wrong. To abide is, and and here's the thing that gets me. If we're going to do the new New Revised Standard Version, one of John's favorite words is not continue. One of John's favorite words, and the only guy in the whole book that writes it over and over again is the word abide. So I'm going to take some time talking about what it means to abide. In the 17th of John, disciples are overhearing Jesus. I think they're, what's the Pennsylvania German word for a nosy neighbor? Is it Winifritz? Yeah, whatever that word is that I don't know what it is. But that's what I'm thinking. These guys are a bunch of oneies. And they're overhearing Jesus. They're sneaking in on Jesus' private life. And Jesus says, this is life, that they may know you, Father, and that they would know me because of you. This is life, Jesus says. Help me, Father, so that my people, your people, my siblings, all of us together in the kingdom of God can be focused on that and only that, that they would know me, Jesus And through me, they would get to know you. I love this text because in it is freedom. The freedom of the gospel is that you have permission to not be perfect. Think about the children that you know. Think about the ones that you've been around that you know. They are super stressed. This ear thing is going to drive me crazy. Um, They are so stressed because they have been under the impression somebody taught them that they have to all win gold medals, that somebody taught them that they have to be perfect. And that is not helpful, plus it's not godly. It's not godly. To be a little naughty, to be a little bit of a, what's the other Pennsylvania German word? A nix nuts. To be a little naughty. Now, some of you, I understand, were probably more than a little naughty. You know, Tatum, Miles. You, you guys took that one to a, you took advantage of that, didn't you? And you were a little bit more than naughty. I'm just joking. But permission to not be perfect. This lesson is saying you're all going to be imperfect. The Romans text is very clear. 
and people that are following the letter of the law, all those places and those places where teachers are up front, pastors are up front, and they're saying, here's the law, so this is what you have to do. These are the rules. This is what you have to do. Don't take it too far. I'm not saying that they're totally incorrect. But if it's not wrapped up and encapsulated in love, if it's not structured appropriately with Paul's letter to the church at Rome, this is the doctrine of the Bible. There's no other book in the Bible that's better than Romans for doctrine. People don't like doctrine because doctrine's complicated. And you got to want it. You got to want it badly. You got to want to go beyond intro Christianity 101. You got to be hungry enough to say, what does it mean for me to be a follower? So apart from the law, we're all dead. We're all sinners. For those of us who say little white lies, for those of us who do bigger sins, if there's such a thing in God's world, and I don't think there is. Sin is sin is sin is sin. And we all sin, whether you're homosexual or heterosexual. It cracks me up. The heterosexuals don't think they sin. Drives me. Yeah. This is clear, is it not? Romans is crystal clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no distinction. You think Paul could say it any clearer than that? Yet we have churches split over this nonsense read your bible and all of a sudden do the harder work now join back together again because this is nuts this is crazy apart from the law the righteousness of god has been disclosed it's attested by the law and the prophets and the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ for all who believe there is no distinction no distinction justified by faith apart from works prescribed in the law it's not the rule book it's God, only God, permission to not be perfect. That doesn't mean go out and murder, doesn't mean go out and embezzle. I'm not talking about that. You with me on this? Do you hear what I'm saying? Good. Freedom is in contrast to sin. It's all about relationships. It doesn't take much for a congregational ministry to get stuck on itself, to be self-centered, to think about it's all about us, it is not. It really is not. It's about people gathering. I could group, gather a group of people from every denomination, non-denomination, atheists, agnostics, get them all in a room and have them excited about what God offers, and that is freedom. But the freedom that our God offers is a being bound to Jesus. The word today, I heard the other day, somebody used the word doulos. Doulos is a, a slave, a bond servant, technically. You're not a slave. You willingly become. That's why we wear this, this thing, a rope. It's called a cincture. And this cincture symbolizes I am a bond servant. I choose to be a slave to God. I want to be attached to God. I want to be obedient to my master. I want a master. And I want to be his slave. Because my master loves this slave. My master appreciates the work that I do as a slave. My master cares about what we do. And we're all offered, we're invited to become a part of this being bound to Jesus. In the 33rd verse, this is the part that cracks me up. So if you've got your little bulletins in front of you, they answered him after Jesus said, you're truly my disciples, um, you, the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. Anybody figure it out? These guys were never slaves to anyone. Boy, did they redact the history book. They just rewrote history. They just said, we don't believe in that stuff in our lives, so we're just going to write it right out of the book. Does that sound familiar? We're just going to erase all this stuff that has happened. They forgot already? <laughs> the God who rescued you from where? Slavery. We have never been slaves to anyone. Knuckleheads. That's not a Pennsylvania German word, is it? 
they were, they, they were rescued from slavery. And that's what we're rescued from because we are bound to sin. We are in bondage to sin. We cannot free ourselves. You ever get around a bunch of smart people in church? They crack me up. Smart people in church really crack me up because they think somehow that they know better than God. I love that. I love that. Because you know where that church is going. They're going as far away from God as you could ever find. Because they're in bondage to sin. They're in slavery. They are slaves to their own images. It seems to me to be fitting of this Reformation theme today. We have to know our history. You've heard me say that before, right? Come to terms with your history. Or else we will claim a false brand. We'll imagine that graven image that we thought was so wonderful. We'll believe it because we've forgotten who we really are and to whom we belong. Can I hear in this Lutheran church an affirmation through saying the word amen? amen? But do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe that the Reformation was because Luther said, and a bunch of other reformers too, Luther was by all means not the only one back there teaching. You got to know where you come from and you have to know to whom you belong. I belong to Jesus. Worship on the mountaintop with Moses or in the temple with Jesus. Jesus says a day will come that all that will wash away because we will worship in spirit and truth. I've seen that happen here, folks. I've seen you at times here at St. John's worship in spirit and truth. I've seen you set aside bricks and mortar. I've seen you set aside 45 North Reading Avenue. I've seen you set all that aside. Because we were worshiping in spirit and truth. And the truth is not to be understood. I'm waving a pencil around. I'm going to be marked up all over the place. Um, and how did I just do that? What did I do? We will know. We will know what? We, the truth is not abstract. I'm not talking about, well, you know the truth about that, Chris. You, you know the truth about that, what's her name? Amanda? You know the truth about that, Tatum. I'm not talking about that. This is not the abstract. Freedom, not in the abstract. Because you can say to someone, you know, you got to turn that athlete. You got to let him go. You got to let him be free. Yeah, but their stride's off. Yeah, but if you try and correct their stride, you're going to take a sub four minute miler and turn them into a 410. So leave them alone. Set them free. That's what's being talked about here. No. What truth is here, what freedom is here, is Jesus. The truth is Jesus. Jesus equals truth. It's the person of Jesus who sets you free, not your behaviors that are consistent with the rule book found in Scripture. That does not set you free. Thou shalt not murder. That sets you free. No, because all of you have murdered. There isn't a person in this room that hasn't thought a bad thought about another person. And according to the Old Testament, a bad thought about another person injures who they are, their potential to have an upright reputation. That is called murder in Scripture. It's not about bang, you're dead. God is reforming the church. We're seeing it all over the place. But we're not seeing the Reformation actually taking place in the congregations across the country. We're seeing reformation happening because people get together and they throw off all the committee meetings and they set aside all the rubrics and they get rid of their little plastic books and the handbooks that are up on the wall with the policies and procedures. It all goes because they just gather around and do what matters to God. We see that, don't we? Operation 143. Tell me that's not a place where people come together they get the job done. They make sure that their specific mission is to be accomplished. Fill these backpacks with food so that kids have food on the weekend. Does that happen? And what does it take? Come together and do. Now what I wish Operation Backpack could do is build a deeper relationship. But that's not their mission. Operation 143, I can't say Operation Backpack, can I? Operation 143, well theirs is the same. But Operation 143 is the one we're committed to. And we are committed to doing that task, and it's necessary. But it's the relationships. If we're a church, if we're the kingdom of God and not just St. John's, and I mean it exactly as I just said it, 
If we're the church, capital C, and not just St. John's, that our ministry is about building and deepening relationships, baby steps, baby steps. You can't get there overnight, but you have to keep going in that direction. God is creating all things new. Could we join God in doing that here at St. John's? Could we do that at St. John's? Because as I look at the bulletin and I listen to what Shannon said earlier, how much more community church do you want to be? Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner. We, we're having the school district's uh, show choir here. We, we, we feed people on Saturday nights. 200 people get meals out the back door. We do all of that. How much more do you want? Well, let me tell you how much more. Build relationships with these people. Not just, I can make a phone call and get somebody here, because I can do that. We all can do that, probably. It's about growing deeper, so that when they are in trouble, they call. When they are excited, they call. When they want to get a cup of coffee, they call. When they want to be thinking about the tough things in their lives to make decisions, they call. Without that, it's the same thing as any social organization. And the church is not just any old social organization. Equipping the saints according to the Bible. Now, how many of you can actually embrace this? Because I'm guessing very few, if any of you, have ever experienced this prime directive. The prime pastoral mandate is not to do ministry for the church members. So my primary mandate is not to do ministry for you. I'm not your hired help. I am to equip saints for works of service so that the body of Christ is built up. If you're breaking through generations of that mindset, it's going to be a whirlwind and turmoil. It's going to be something that you got to really recognize. And that's why I've said to a few people recently, because it's finally dawning on me, what's made things difficult at times for us? It's because we're not on the same page. I am not here to be your hired help at St. John's and to do your ministry. I am here to equip you, and that's the difference. It's not St. John's, it's the kingdom of God. It's all about the kingdom of God. Whether you worship here or you worship in a Presbyterian church, God, even if you worship in a Methodist church, I'm joking. I'm saying the prime pastoral mandate according to Paul, unless you want to take that out of the Bible. But that's your primary. That's the primary, and that's what every member should know and understand, which means there's an obligation for the members to be equipped. How many of you want to be equipped, and how many of you are saying, I'm too busy to be equipped? How many of you want to be children of God, and how many of you want to just like the little logo and sticker, I gave blood? How many of you want to give life? I want to give life. I don't know. I say that all the time. Cracks me up. An invitation to share what you know with me and to join with you in figuring something out. Well, that's what we try to do with everybody around here. And do you know how hard that is? It's not hard to say, I don't know, except unless you're one of those people that actually believe when you say, I don't know, uh uh-oh, they might think I'm less than. Uh-oh, they might think I'm stupid. Abby, say I don't know as many times as you can while you're a teenager because at some point your parents are going to say, oh, grow up, or act like an adult and say, I'm not an adult. I'm just a kid. Tatum, there's your out on everything. Just say, I'm just a kid. So leave it at that. I think I'm still 14. An invitation to share what they know. And to join together in figuring something out. What do you think? That's that's what you really want to ask. Mary Kay, what do you think? Go to one of our team meetings now. You're going to hear that a lot. What do you think? What do you think at a council meeting? What do you think? And you know the best answer? I don't know either. Let's pray. That's the best answer. And you know how often you hear that in a church meeting? So infrequently. I go to meetings with pastors, and I keep thinking, I don't care what you think. What does God think? Let's do the hard work of listening to God. What would would Michael Jordan do? Who cares? What would Biden do? Who cares? What would Trump do? Who cares? What would God do? 
That's what children of God ask. What do you think, God? How should our faith shape our daily lives? Get more people involved in interpreting texts. Many of you probably would have read the text today and said, that sounds good because you believe somebody got it right. Sorry, they got it wrong. The NRSV got it wrong. Continue is a watered-down version. Abide. What does it mean to abide? It means to be grafted in. It means with intentionality, I want to be connected. It's the difference between I have to go to church because my mom and dad make me go to church or my spouse makes me go to church twice a year, whatever, or I want to go to church. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want to believe that God loves me in spite of. Empower people to think for themselves. That is the missing element, I think, in school. I want to teach a class at Boyertown Area School District. I'll teach for free. I want to teach a class called Think. We sometimes make it fancy. We call it symbolic logic. You want to be a lawyer? You have to take an undergraduate course in symbolic logic because when you take your LSATs, you know what they want? They want to know do you have the capacity and the competence to think. Think is really important because most people just want to defer. Hey, where do you want to go to dinner tomorrow night? I don't know. Wherever you want to go is fine. Then you say something, they say, I don't want to go there. Pennsylvania German, bus come do. Help them make the connections between faith and daily life. Can we together help people make connections between their heart faith and their daily living? And can we create a congregation where things that matter can be talked about safely? There are too many topics that I've had people privately say to me, I can't bring that up in church. I can't talk about that even in a small group because I'm afraid what people are going to think of me. For God's sake, you've been around me for nine years and I'm sure I've embarrassed you more than once because I'm not afraid to talk about pretty much anything because I think that's what matters. Where are our kids going to go? You want to start talking about mental health? Then you better start with that. You better have an environment first where anything can be discussed without judgment and ridicule. If we're not a safe place, then pray to God they go to some other church. We have to be a safe enough place that people can come here and learn all the things that are touching their lives specifically. The real measure is the legacy we leave for others to build on. Because we're not going to leave millions of dollars like our funds in the past have. No one's going to leave millions of dollars in the future. We just don't do that anymore. It's been a long time since that's happened. But thank God they are. Because if it weren't for that legacy financially, we wouldn't be. But the legacy I'm talking about is one that's built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and good, solid teaching. And people hungry to open up their Bibles and sit down and study together and listen to the Word of God together. Lectio Divina, God's Word blesses us, is exactly what that is. It's a little sheet of paper that guides you through a structured way. For those of us that like structure... It helps you get to the core of Scripture, the root of it. And no matter what position we hold or how long we've held it, it's not my church, it's not your church, and the day that I'm out of here, just forget me. Because the only thing I want you to remember is Jesus. It's the only name I want you to remember, Jesus. And pass on to future generations Christ's church in better shape than we found her. And I'm not just talking about cleaning up a building for $2 million dollars. $2 $2 million to refab, re, redo this church. That's what we've spent, $2 million. And you still have more money than you've ever had in your lives. And you're working off of a staff that get paid $100,000 less than when I arrived. Isn't that interesting? You're doing all this work on less. But you have more. And there's the real measure right there. It's passing on for future generations Christ's church in better shape than we found her.